Everybody, uh, welcome to the Snap No Tap podcast. I'm Tony Cicchini with our, our host today, Martin Witkowski. Joe Cardinals, as we're doing this, is right now on an airplane flying of all places to Paris, France with his wife. This is not a joke for a what they call a destination wedding. Joe's already married, but it's a friend of the family. Um, so Martin subbing this weekend and next weekend. And then Joe, Joe's coming back sometime next Sunday night, but it'll be too late. But uh, welcome. Great to have you, Martin. Well, thank you, Tony. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, trying to master this whole recording thing. And I've come to appreciate that not is only Joe, the best man that I've ever met, <laughs> best looking man I've ever met, but he's also quite talented. Oh, well, you know what? And speaking of talent, that introduction, uh, the drummer was the legendary Chicago drummer, Rusty Jones, who passed away, unfortunately. And the reason I bring it up, the last time I saw Rusty, many years ago, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago, uh, I was walking into the Red Apple, and he was coming out, and we chatted for a bit. Now, for those who don't aren't from Chicago, Red Apple's a famous or well, well-known uh, Polish buffet all you can eat buffet restaurant uh chadnina's or yeah i think that's the first no chadnina's blood sausage but but anyway it's the it's the red apple on milwaukee right near niles in chicago you've been there haven't you that's right i have and it, it used to be also quite inexpensive you could really go like feed yourself for twenty dollars yeah i think it's probably gone up i haven't been there in a long time but yeah that's because i always went to other places because that's right on the cusp that's like one block before niles and that's that was way out of my way, but uh, yeah, that was uh, it's not Chadnina's because that's blood sausage. Uh, Ch Chobiel, no, Chobiel's was across the street. Well, whatever, but it's known as the Red Apple. Um, right, Chodwone Yabushko is what you call it in Polish. That's it. Yeah. So I can't. I couldn't remember, but yep. Uh, very good restaurant. There used to be one on Belmont called Stata Polska, probably before you lived here. And they close down. And then I go to the Jolly Inn, which is basically Narragansett and um, Harlem. Uh, I love it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I guess people don't want to hear about the Polish buffets, although I love my Polish food, believe it. But yeah, we're. Uh, I'm excited for Joe. He he contacted me. I thought he had already been in the air like on Thursday, but he contacted me as he was boarded or once he boarded the airplane just to check in. and. And uh, I said, yeah, we exchanged some, you know, well wishes and whatever. And uh, he wanted to know about my MRI. And then I wanted to know what he's going to do when he's in Paris. And yeah, can you believe he's going to Paris? No, no, I can't believe it. I, I don't think Paris would really allow Joe because as good looking as he is, he's going to take all the runway models away. Oh, that, and you know what? And if the French see him, on the streets, they're going to riot and start demolishing all the statues and all the historical things they have there because they're like, well, we got him now, you know. Right. Who needs all this other crap? Well, get a, get a load of this. What I'm thinking now, I'm wondering if they're going to hold him hostage, too, because, well, of course, America don't want him back. So, so it wouldn't even be a hostage thing with him. Um, yeah, we, we might have given all our bargaining chips away, too. So I, we might be left with nothing. Yeah, right. I mean. But yeah, I hope he has a good time. I mean, it's, you know, those de destination weddings. Um, I, I I got invited to like two. One, I just couldn't make because that was 9-11, you know, when airports and everything was shut down. Uh, even though I had an airline ticket to go before, you know, and then 
you know, the bombing happened. And uh, and then the other one was in like the Caribbean, uh, if I remember correctly, Bermuda or somewhere. And I, I just I couldn't make it. But um, yeah, uh, I don't plan on getting married again. So there'll be no destination. But if it, if I do, we'll just ours will be at Wendy's restaurant or something. All right, we'll do one of the Polish buffets. There you go. Yeah, we can go to Czerwone Jabuszko in Niles. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what's cooking, man? So uh, we went through a workout this morning. Uh, thank yeah. you. I feel like my grip is still burnt. Uh, just to <laughs> give any, uh, people an idea of uh, what, what's involved. So Tony's focusing on uh, working on my grip. Like grip is part of what really helps in wrestling. It's always been one of the things that Tony would focus on training. And, uh, you know, there is different things you can do for it. And given like limited equipment and we're doing this on Zoom, uh, we're kind of focusing on using like farmer's walk and doing curls and push presses. But there are other things that you've used in the past, right, Tony? Many things, yeah, uh-huh. Um... The simplest is getting a sheet of newspaper, putting your hand in the middle and just crumbling it up. That's one that anybody can do because most people have access to newspapers. But uh, grip, um, hanging grips, uh, you know, like chin-ups, holding them fully extended and up above, with your chin above the bar. Uh, and then more advanced stuff that I'd have to kind of show, like designing gloves. You get like workers' gloves and you put you either stitch or cut holes and make loops and you actually lift weights with your fingers. And this is the thing with Radvan. People just tend to think about grips like those grippers, like the captains of crush. That's only one way to, to, to develop a grip. But if you work your individual fingers, that's where you get the w unbelievable strength in your hands. What else? Pinch grip of the plates, lifting. I used to lift a, I used to have a dumbbell and I got some PVC real wide, like three over three inches of PVC made it super wide. And I didn't knurl it. I didn't want to use metal where you knurled it. Cause that, that helps you, that, that helps you retain. I wanted to use the PVC and just start lifting wide and deep. Um, but I have a bigger, I have a big hand, so it's easier for me to grip those larger things. And then, of course, I had that grip machine. That's what I ended up blowing my arm out. It's weird, but I, I did. Joe was there. But, yeah, there's a lot of – I mean, grip is very important. And, and I think people need to work their grip in two ways. Crushing strength uh, and then endurance as well. And just sitting here opening and closing your hand, opening, them, opening, it, opening it all the way and closing it over and over for reps, just doing that with no weights. Very few people could probably do 100 reps because, man, you're going to get all cramped out. So this is something that anybody can do at any time, even at work. You know, just open and close your hand. But open it all the way, not harshly, all the way. Open it and close it. And then, you know, work for speed and just, you know, see how many reps you can get. Shake it off and do sets. Um, that That's something that, again, costs nothing you know just just do this and my my goodness will that will that help with your endurance right so yeah you know, i i think that what we have um done and you know I encourage people to take advantage of tony's uh training is that you know just the, the grip training was actually also a tremendous amount of effort I mean, I mean sweat was completely dripping out of me i drank a half liter bottle sorry a one liter bottle of of water afterwards i was so drained but what are the practical applications of grip uh, for wrestling? It's more obvious, but, but for like other sporting applications, like even in boxing, I mean, you, you have gloves on, so there isn't really much grip there that I can think of other than general fitness, anything else that you could think yeah. of? Well, okay. Let's just the, the focusing on the boxing part of it, but it, it's, it's, it's being able to have that power to make a clenched fist. Believe it or not, some people have, I call it like a soft, fist now i don't talk, i'm not talking about the power of the punch but their their hand it, it, they can't form that rock solid grip at moment of impact okay because naturally you want to have your hands open so you don't tense up and slow yourself down but at the moment of impact you want to have it like a rock um you don't want it in essence hollow uh pro wrestling when they do the fake punches they they make a hollow fist okay so it looks to the 
um, the audience that that it's a clenched fist, but it's really not. It's kind of hollow fist. But there's a lot of people that just don't have that kind of grip strength or the endurance in a fight um, to keep that grip going uh, over and over. So that's important uh, for for uh, boxing, but also for street fighting. If you want to close that fist, make your fist tight so you're not breaking anything. Um, it works if you're wielding a weapon, uh, especially if it's either a flexible weapon or let's say a pipe or a stick, you know, you're not going to have to worry about it flying out of your hand. Uh, to me, there's just absolutely no reason to not work your grip. It's, it's one of those things that doesn't take up a lot of space, doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, and it, the benefits are, are tremendous. Just, just watch it. You don't overdo it. It's like any other exercise. You don't want to go nuts uh, and overtrain and hurt yourself. But, um, and then tennis players, they like to work their grip. I remember as a kid, I never really played tennis. I played it briefly in high school, but um, they would talk about squeeze. They, they, they sold grippers specifically for like tennis players, you know, because they're holding on to the racket, you know? And right, you can squeeze the ball too. You, you squeeze the tennis ball. And, and and baseball players, you know, with the ball bat, you know, I, I would assume that they work their grip. Again, I only played Little League baseball. I never took it any further. Um, yeah, I, I but because of Radvan with his, I mean, he to this day, I've said it, I've never felt a grip like that. I missed out on meeting Danny Hodge because I would have loved to have felt his grip um, to compare. Because Rod Von's grip, I still remember it to this day. It's one of those things that you just don't forget. Uh, the, the, there was a, there's a guy in Chicago, uh, John McDonough, an Irish guy, and he's real. He's a smaller guy, probably 165 pounds. He's got a really great grip too. Probably the second best I've ever uh, encountered. But what about him is you can't move his fingers sideways. He's he's got it. it there's he's freaky. Okay. And I haven't seen him in a long time. He's pretty much deaf. He's got that thick, thick, thick Irish brogue. It's hard to understand him. But, uh, yeah, he's he's got a tremendous grip. So every time I see him, him and I lock up hands. Uh, he's 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 another – but he's not – you know, he he's just a regular guy. He was a bricklayer, but just one of those things. He just had that grip. Right. So to summarize for people listening, Tony makes a very good point that really you need grip to hold your hand closed and you want your hand closed at the moment of impact, even in a you know a striking situation, because anything other than that becomes like a hollow absorbent thing versus an actual, you know, tool for striking. You, you got it, you know, because and, and again, there's like uh, theories about open hand strikes and all that. I, I can palm heal. I've done all of that, you know, bitch slap and everything else. Uh, but in all the times I've punched people, I've never injured my hands. Okay. Now, again, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen or it can't happen to you, but my hands, I've, I've always had, let me put it this way. I had a conundrum because I was also a musician. Okay. Like the accordion, especially. And I was kind of worried about doing certain exercises because I didn't want to damage my fingers for music. All right. But again, once, once I got past that, knowing, okay, my hands are all right. I'm never going to be a concert artist. The hell with it. Fighting is going to be more important than being a, a virtuoso. Um, I just, Katie barred the door and I just kept working it, working it, working it. Um, so I've never damaged my hands. Uh, you, but you got to watch your wrist too. Cause if you start to flex and bend your wrist, you can, you can break your wrist in, in, a, in a fight, you know, like a, a fracture. Um, but palm heels will work, but palm heels also can be de dangerous because you can bend, you can miss and bend your fingers backwards. Uh, anytime you open up your hands, like if you miss the guy can maybe grab it, you know, start, you know, prying on your fingers. You des definitely don't want that. So, um, and I'm glad you made me think that because again, when we wrestle, we don't generally want to have our hands open, our fingers open. You want them closed. So a good tight grip, man, and it's intimidating. You, the guy can't get loose, and all of a sudden he's freaking out. 
Right. And I, I just wanted to point out again that the way you're training the group is like a like a full fitness regimen. I I really experienced a lot of uh, satisfaction from this workout. I was totally tired and we focused on grip. You wouldn't think that, but it totally is an exertion. Well, the thing for, for people got to understand about Martin, Martin has a, he's a freak with his conditioning. He's really gifted. And Martin's body, like all of ours, adapts, but Martin's adapts quickly. All right. So he's very challenging as a co as an instructor, as a coach for me to keep pushing his body without like making him injured, but switching it up to trick his body into doing stuff. Uh, and he'll probably be okay with this routine for another couple of weeks, but then it's boom, we got to change it again. Cause he just adapts. So we do conditioning, regular conditioning. We do boxing with, with this workout and then this strength oriented grip and, and, and upper body uh, workout, I guess you'd say even legs. We, cause you're doing steps with the dumbbells, but basically he's, he's holding these dumbbells uh, for a good solid 20 minutes. All right. But sometimes now, like today, he was so fatigued. He had to drop them a few times, but imagine doing curls, overheads, farmer's walks, going up and down steps without ever letting go of the dumbbells. All right. This is challenging and it's not something that you can just do. You got to, you know, Martin's been training with me now for a while this way on zoom. So it's just something we've been building up, but he's a sensational athlete. You don't give yourself credit, but man, he's freaky if guys, for the people who are watching or listening, Martin's the guy that's on the lucky 13 that goes nonstop like the energizer bunny. Um, and that was 20 years ago that we filmed the lucky 13 and he, he could still do it today. So hats off to you, man. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I'm a 50 year old <laughs> man at this point, <laughs> but I, uh, again, like, uh, it, it's a, it's a great fitness routine. And the other thing that I always point out to people that ask about training with you is that I never have an issue getting out of bed in the morning after one of those. It's not the kind of stuff that will stress out your joints. It's fairly low impact, but it is exertion. And really that's kind of uh, the, the essence of it is to get a good workout in without having to sacrifice or risk your, uh, your joints. Well, and two for the people at home, <clears throat> that may be interested in doing a zoom with me. Let me, let me make this perfectly clear. Martin's working out of his basement. He's got one, like a fold out mat, one of those four by eights. And he, he's got a heavy bag uh, and a set of dumbbells. That's it. I mean, he bought boxing gloves and he's got like steps that go upstairs. So we're utilizing just the first step. All right. So even if you didn't have steps, you could get like uh, crates or something. Uh, so my point of bringing this up is you don't need to have a gymnasium to do this uh, or, or even a large space uh, because Martin's really not. Well, what do you think that space is that you're working out at? Forget about the steps, but just the space. Uh, maybe eight by eight feet. Yeah. Eight by eight. And then he does a farmer's walk the length of his um, uh, basement in back, but that's it. So, you know, it's a really great workout because so many times, and this is stuff that you could do if you're in a hotel room. Okay. Uh, people don't have access sometimes to, to actual gyms or like I belong to planet fitness where I can't do powerlifting types of workouts. As a matter of fact, you're not even, not only do they not have the equipment, you're there, you're not allowed. Okay. That that's one of those, you can't grunt and all that, that, that thing. Um, but I should give a shout out because general manager called me yesterday um to just like explain what's what what's happening at the gym and i you know i left kudos to the girl that's the the daytime manager she's awesome but you know they're short staffed hours are you know but he called me he reached out to apologize and say he's on it they're trying to get help so um that's a good thing so i'll give him benny's on that man it was really nice of him to do that but but yeah, no, Martin's Martin's one of those uh, fanatics, and he he's um, he's dedicated. And I don't let him really know what's going on, like how many reps, how this because I switch it up, you know. And he just follows along, and I keep tabs over here. I keep track of of his repetitions, and it's a science. It's just not uh, random numbers or, or random exercises. I see where his deficits are. 
So I got, I got to build his deficits, build them up. But the stuff that he's already strong at, I got to keep increasing that too. So, uh, and it ultimately in time, it'll hopefully start to catch up. And it's doing that now. It's starting to catch up. So, uh, yeah, he's he's a great athlete. <laughs> so, Tony, we uh, we talked about discussing a little uh, more about boxing. And there is like a, a fight that we've both watched, which was last week. It was a, a fight between um, a British guy named uh, Daniel Dubois and uh, I think a South African guy named Kevin Larena. And you know, I've recommended that Tony watch it, not because of any particular significance of greatness of that fight, but just because it was eventful. And I had a few questions about all the things that went down in that fight. And I wanted to get, you know, Tony's opinion as somebody who's trained in boxing and has seen a, a million fights in, in his day. So first of all, Tony, like, what was your impression of, um, you know, Daniel Dubois? Like the, the, the thing is that this guy was touted as the next Tyson. And I never believed that his style was at all like Tyson's like he doesn't approach boxing the same way Mike Tyson did um you know I, I always thought that it was kind of a cop-out because Mike Tyson was a black guy this guy's a black guy so therefore Daniel Dubois is the next Mike Tyson uh what, what do you think about you know his approach to boxing versus what like Mike Tyson would do well I the other guy looked more like Tyson to be honest with you but no uh no Dubois okay I, I'll just lay it out first of all he wasn't in shape all right he he looked soft Anybody who ever, well, both fighters did, but we'll get to the other guy in a minute. Um, Tyson was always, when he was the king, he was rock hard, okay? He was low body fat. He was built like a fire hydrant. Uh, Dubois more, uh, you know, built more like along, more like me, okay? Um, and no, he's not a Tyson. Uh, he was backing up a lot in this fight. Uh, he wasn't very aggressive. Uh, even though he ended up winning the fight, it was a very freaky thing. And we'll get to it. I'm sure you have some questions about that. The announcers were kind of bullshitters. They were, it would have been easier for me to watch it with the sound off because I don't think they really had a clue what they were talking about. Um, but apparently he injured his ankle uh, and, and that kind of stopped his um, maneuverability. But he was backing up an awful lot. He did not look like Mike Tyson. I'm shocked to hear you tell me that they thought he was a Tyson. There's nothing reminiscent about Mike Tyson, at least in my opinion. Right. I mean, typically you would see Mike Tyson try to close the distance early, get in close, and be very aggressive with all the uh, all the work that he did. And I, I never got that impression from... I've seen Daniel Dubois in a few fights already, and it's it's not like that. He's He can be aggressive, but it's not the same way that Tyson chases that close distance fight yeah and he looked like more like a the straight uh, a straight puncher tyson liked to set up for that left hook uh he's a lot taller at least he appeared to be he was taller than this guy that he fought uh Loretta. so uh yeah i never got that impression uh <clears throat> i just think he just didn't seem in shape uh he just looked soft i i you know for those who are fighters they you know what i'm talking about you know he just didn't look, he just looked soft. Uh, Lareda, on the other hand, was was puffy. He's a blown up cruiserweight, okay? So he's artificially gaining weight, and it shows. Uh, again, he was another one who wasn't in shape. And he may never get that heavyweight physique or that heavyweight shape because he's just not a natural, natural heavyweight. Now, the same could be said of uh, Vander Holyfield, but you could see that Holyfield was a weight-trained tra weight athlete. Now, Lareda did look like he's probably lifted, but there was just a lot of artificial weight. It, he just did not seem – he was carrying around – to me, it looked like he was carrying around a lot of body fat. You can never say that about Evander Holyfield in his prime. He, the guy, you know, looked like he could have – you know, came off of a natural bodybuilding stage. Um so that's something to always contend with when Roy Jones stepped up to fight for heavyweight, you know, he actually didn't try to come in at 220 or whatever. He just got up to probably as, as heavy as he felt he could. And I believe he fought Frank Ruiz, if I remember correctly. And I just figured going up against Ruiz, there's really no point in even putting on any size because um, he, 
he needed his his speed and his attributes to win that fight, and that's exactly what he did. He used his speed and his his athleticism, which Lareda doesn't have that those kind of attributes that Roy Jones had. A uh, very few, very 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 few human beings have that kind of athletic uh, abilities that Roy Jones had. Um, <clears throat> I was not impressed with either one, but I mean, obviously Dubois is the the better fighter, but I don't know what happened to him. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he twisted his ankle. Let's hope that's the case because those punches, that one punch that hit him on the top of the head, um, man, that wasn't, that, that did not appear to be much. Again, looks can be deceiving, but the other punches, I don't even think landed. And that's why I was wondering, oh man, is he taking a dive here? That's what I originally thought that he was dumping the fight, but he didn't because he ended up coming back to win. Uh, right. So to your point, there is there is five do, five inches of height difference between these guys. Like you said, uh, Lorena is like a, a cruiserweight size, and uh, Dubois is six foot five. And then to describe what uh, what you're you're talking about, at two thirds of the way through the first round, it it looks like Lorena kind of maybe ducks under some punches and ends up clipping the top of the head of, of his opponent with what looks like a left hook, I think, or yeah, I think, I think that's what it was. I think so. So, so what do you think are the mechanics there? Because the, the announcers, like they, they went on and on about how there is such a thing as getting an equilibrium shot. They kept calling it that causes the person to stumble because Dubois, after getting hit with that punch, spent the rest of the round backpedaling and falling over himself. Yeah, but then they they kind of backpedaled themselves on that and said, oh, he injured his ankle. Look, it was his ankle. His ankle would make more sense. Again, yes, well, they're using a term equi equilibrium shot, but basically you got your bell rung. That's what we say here in, in, in this country. And, you know, you, you're trying to get your head clear. Uh, if that's the case, and we won't know unless we, unless we could ask him and he'd be honest, then he, there's a serious issue here because that was – almost like a grazing blow, okay? It wasn't like a, a concussive type of shot where he clipped him on the uh, solid on the temple. This this was almost over like the top of the head, if, if I can remember correctly, okay? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it wasn't like a crushing contact. It was no like, like you said, kind of went through it. Right. So let's give Dubois, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and, and I'm going to say I hope it was an ankle injury because otherwise – that's telling me he cannot take a shot, um, and and I, I got I'm gonna I'm gonna just go with the ankle thing, okay? Because apparently, he said in the run, in the corner, my ankle hurts or something. That's what the announcer said. I I couldn't quite hear it, um, but it, the the mechanics were. It, it just seemed like I can't really fault Dubois. I mean, he was or not Dubois, the Lareda. He threw it when he had the opportunity. Uh, he 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 tried to look like Tyson. He tried to do the side, you know, the side motion and everything. We talked about this earlier when I was giving you your training today. Um, he didn't quite have that because he was always coming back to center line. So he's pivoting, you know, back and forth like this, but he's coming back to center line so he can get clobbered. The thing about Lare uh, Dubois, I noticed it is he kept his left elbow out, and I don't like that. I like to keep it more. Um, vertical so you can protect your ribs and get a, a straighter jab when you're flared out like that anybody who's trained with me knows that uh, i i'm opposed to that being flared out like that chicken winging it out uh and he did that quite a few times uh whereas i don't remember lareda doing that um my personal opinion lareda probably should step down to cruiser uh but of course the you know, it's all about heavyweight. That's the glamour division, middleweight and heavyweight. He'll never make it in middleweight, but uh, he's got to work on his conditioning. And again, stepping up to heavyweight, he, you know, it's kind of hard to be in shape when you're like a lighter guy bumping up all that. All that. How much did he weigh in that fight? Do you know, I think this was at uh, 240 pounds. 240? Yeah. Yeah. See, that's all fat. 240 I mean, was you're not plus weight. Yeah, no, sorry, 240 was was uh, uh, Lorena's weight, and sorry, 230 was Lorena's weight, 240 was Dubois' weight. So yeah, see, Lorena's that, giving away 10 pounds. 
and and he's not i mean he's he's weighs more than me and i'm taller than him and i'm more athletically built than Loretta. so yeah he's carrying a lot of fat uh that's not good now you could tell in his midsection um he just didn't look fit and that that hurts your mobility okay there's fat people that can actually work up their conditioning uh, you don't have to look like you know hercules but your mobility how are you are, are you know what's your his frame is not a large frame okay so it's hard to carry that extra weight like if if i would get up to 280 okay i'm 220 if i got up to 280 i mean it would be man it would be brutal on my on my joints my frame's not built for that okay um i'm a natural light heavyweight but i took years to put this size on and my body adapted okay to it uh i didn't rush and put it on in a year all right there's a big difference there um but yeah uh dubois ended up w getting him with a straight left hand that opened him up and then uh a, an uppercut that was kind of brutal and i think he followed it up maybe with a left hook um you know like a one two three and the ref stopped the contest uh but Part of the issue there was, and we, we discussed this, that Loretta, uh, when you're when you're when you're on Queer Street, when you're when you're really hurt and you can't think clear, your instincts can no longer be to just cover up. Okay, and that's what happened there, and he got through on it. You got to clinch, you got to tie up, you've got to learn to just grab the guy's arm, arms, and let the referee break you up, okay? That's fine. You hold on for three, four seconds until the ref breaks you up, cover a little bit more, get back in and clinch again. You can't keep on doing this, but you can do it at least two or three times. Worst case, you may, you'll, you'll get a verbal, you know, lashing, but you probably won't get a point taken away unless you continue to do it like extensively, but you've got to tie the guy up, waltz him around. So you're not just hanging out for dear life, but he almost tried to do a rope -a dope thing. If again, if I'm if I'm picturing this right, uh, no, you are right. And, and to your point, I think I, my impression was that the very first punch of that sequence was quite devastating because he split the guard, backstepped him, and eventually, like you said, there was a lot of covering up and giving more of a target than than trying to work out of that situation in a different way. Absolutely, and then the uppercut just and it was beautiful. That was a beautiful combination. So many times. You got to do a quick self assessment. Even when you're not thinking clearly, you got to think clearly, meaning, all right, I'm in trouble here. Your instinct has to be to tie up. That's why it's imperative when you're sparring to work tie ups in your sparring. Now, I don't know his, this guy. I never saw him fight before, so I don't know what his camp is like. But this even pertains to MMA guys or what anybody, you know, you've got to learn to tie up. Even, even when it's just sparring and you're not hurt, you got to get the instinct to do that. You got to get the muscle memory developed in uh, the, how do I tie up? Okay. Um, because especially when your, your bell's rung, if you, if you're not an expert at how to tie up, how to clinch, you're not going to be able to pull it off. So this is something that absolutely has to be worked on in your training, um, learning to tie up when you have a clear mind and you're not hurt. So anybody that's out there that's watching or listening, you need to start, um, uh, you know, overhook in the above the elbow, get that tricep, you know, tie the guy up, um, at least do that and, and start working for angles, like move him around. Like I say, try to pivot the guy uh, just so he's off balance. So the second you let go, he's not in a position to, you know, immediately slam you with a punch. Um, just these are just things you have to do. Uh, you, you, you know, you can't rely always on, on, on covering up and shit, uh, especially when you're fighting a guy that's, you know, so much bigger than you, he's going to get through to you, you know, so tie, tie the guy up. I, I don't know right. if his corner was yelling at him to do that or not. I told you I couldn't hear that, but. Yeah, but, but to your point, like the, the instinct wasn't there. Like I, I, I thought after the first punch, he was in a lot of trouble and it wasn't going to just stop. The trouble was going to keep coming. Yeah. Um, uh, also, going back to uh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
I, I was going to go back to this whole like equilibrium shot because I've heard, heard the announcers uh, talk about this, you know, mystical way to hit somebody behind the ear that just yeah. makes them go completely wacky. Is that even a realistic technique or is it just something that you uh, as a boxer might get lucky and, and land something with that effect, but you can't really, you know, pick your shots to that, with that level of precision. Oh no, it's a legit shot. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you get hit in the back of the head, man, you can get lightheaded. It's the, it's the, by the ear, you, you can't rabbit punch the guy. So yeah, it's something that's very difficult, you know, cause you're, you're hitting a, uh, you're, it's a small target. What I would recommend, especially when you got gloves, is aim for the ear. If you can get the ear, you know, and, and hit that ear to kind of disrupt the equilibrium there. So some of you that are listening or watching, at one point in your life, you may have or you may have known somebody who had like an inner ear infection, all right? And that affected their equilibrium. So it's a legit thing, all right? It's not um, a made-up term like solar plexus is a made-up term, uh, although the getting hit, is a legit thing um but yeah it's a target that's kind of small to hit but yeah if you can clock it yeah you can do some damage um also if you can aim for the neck you know pound the guy in the neck now that's harder to do boxing and i'll t let's see i'm gonna turn sideways here i guess so you so my hand is big so i can barely hit my neck now imagine with a glove on Okay, a boxing glove. I'm going to be catching the guy's jaw, all right, um, which, again, isn't a bad thing, but it's not the neck. So in a street fight or in an MMA match or a grappling thing, punch that neck, chop it, you know, palm heel, hit it, whatever you can, um, because that's another viable target uh, either side, you know, either neck or, you know, either side of the neck, um, throat. But again, in boxing, it that that's that's hard to do, okay? Because you know most good boxers, you know, keep their chin down, so you're not going to get in there. Uh, they don't do it to necessarily protect the throat punch, but it's to keep the button, the size of the, the chin, from so that you don't get knocked out. You know, so that you want you want to tuck it. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm rambling, but it's all interconnected. So if you can't get the ear, go for the the neck or go for the, the, the chin, you know, the call it's called getting hit on the button. Um, <clears throat> and you can drop a guy in like a heart in a heartbeat like that. Uh, and of course the temple, these are all true targets. These are not, you know, mystical things, but they're, they're, they're legit. But, but again, people have to understand when you got boxing gloves on, it changes things. You're not allowed to, you like palm heels, you're not allowed to hit a boxer. You, boxing, you can't throw an open hand. You know, you can't slap. Uh, so some of these strikes, boxers not, I mean, we all know how to do it for the street. You just, you're not going to see it in a competition because it's illegal. Just like forearms and elbows, you know, that, that, they, they know how to do it. I mean, it's not like maybe a tie boxing elbow, but trust me, they know how to, they know how to land elbows. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, it's a legitimate shot, but I don't believe that happened in this instance. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Like it was uh, again, kind of weird. And the announcers made some mention of this that he basically took the knee three times in a single round, and there was no three knockdown rule in effect. But after taking a knee so many times, sometimes the referee jumps in and stops the fight. So it was kind of a, a weird occurrence for that to happen that often, and and the fight to go on. Um, whereas the referee stopped the, the the fight in the third round almost immediately. Well, the, the referees that, trained that, to look in his strong. eyes, and that's what I was doing because I I went I was going from the avenue that this is a fixed fight. He he he's he's dumping here. Okay, um, he had clear eyes. He walked back to the corner. There was one point where he was he was down or he was about to go all the way down, and uh, Lareda was going to throw another punch. It might have been a hook or a right cross, I, it, it doesn't matter. And then he dove down. Um, Dubois like, like, almost like sprawled. And that right there told me, there's nothing wrong with his brain, okay? Something is up here. So like I said, I thought he's, he's you know, he's thrown the fight. But then when, the, when they said they heard him talk about his ankle, 
it made perfect sense. But yeah, I don't believe this is just me. I don't know the guy. I never saw him fight before. I I, I don't believe that uh, that punch. I mean, it may have shocked him or caught him off balance or something. I don't know, but I I, I just don't think it had that great effect. I, I just don't think it did. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're both like looking at it from the outside looking in. But I, I've seen this before where in the middle of a of a boxing match, somebody would suffer a devastating leg injury that basically, you know, put the fight to an end. Like it just happens by by the virtue of them being under pressure and stepping wrong and something twists and turns and it's over. Yeah, I've seen a knee blown out. Um, uh, I'm sure I've seen an ankle. You know, I've seen so many fights through the years, it's kind of hard to remember everything. But, oh, yeah, no, it, it it can happen. I mean, I've, I've walked just sometimes I'll twist the wrong way just walking and I'll feel it in one of my knees, you know. Uh, and granted, we're talking about an ankle here, but rolling an ankle, that can happen. Um, absolutely no doubt. Yeah, it happens in almost every sport. Um, what, what do you think about, um, you know, the, this uh, application? We talked a little bit about the equilibrium shot in um, – possibly like a street fight situation uh what about a, a jab like i know you're a big proponent of a jab but i heard people say that like in a street fight jab is almost a throwaway because nobody has a good jab so you should just you know fling it out there and just try to whack the person with your right hand as as hard as possible well if you don't have a good jab you probably don't have a good right hand i mean again who are these people and you know what there's two types of people those that'll just get by and those who want to be better I was always the type of guy that wanted to do it right because doing it wrong can cause a lot of problems. Um, you can get countered. You can injure yourself. Spend the time learning how to do the jab and the whole world opens up to you. Okay. Um, you can fake the jab and shoot in on the guy. You can fake the jab and kick the guy, whatever. Uh, you're always, I'm not going to get into a, a debate with someone who's going to sit there and say, I'm not going to spend my time working on a jab. Then what else are you not going to spend your time on? Okay. If, if, if you think a jab is, is insignificant, then I don't think you're like a good judge of what to do. I mean, it would be like going to the dentist and say, you know what? I don't think you really need to brush your teeth. Okay. Just 10 seconds is enough. No, I'm going to find another dentist. All right. And a jab sets up everything. See, again, this is people who don't understand striking and especially boxing. Your right hand it's going to be much harder to land a right hand against, I'm talking about it against somebody who's trained, not a bum off the street. You can do almost anything, but a guy who's trained just to throw that launch that right hand. It's, it's going to take longer than a left jab. And if you, if you can't throw a good left, you're not going to throw that good, right. He's going to be able to block that. But with the left, with the jab, starting with that left hand, that can open up, that can make the guy drop his guard or get him in a different direction. And then you can throw that right hand or jab and then hook off the jab and set up all sorts of other options, throwing your elbows off that jab. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say. They don't want to do the jab. Don't do the jab. But I'm going to do the jab and everybody I train is going to learn a, to jab. Uh, and there's different jabs. There's more than one type of jab. So they would learn that just like because I believe that's a fundamental that absolutely needs to be to be learned. Get hit with a jab a few times and you'll know. Were you at the gym that one time? I don't want to mention names because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But that one guy, and I just jabbed him, and I jabbed him so many times, I knocked him into the garbage can. Yes, yes, I was there for that. Yeah. <clears throat> right. I mean, just and that was it, just jabs. He couldn't handle that, okay? And, and he was a competitor. He ended up competing. He couldn't handle that. You know, just my jab, boom, was so – now imagine – um a Larry Holmes jab or, 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 or Oscar De La Hoya. Okay. The damage that that could, that could do. And also when you throw a right hand, when you throw a jab, you're still in great position to sprawl. If you have to, if the guy slips under and, you know, or whatever he does and shoots in you, you're in a good sh spot to do it. Where you, when you throw that right hand, you're crossing your body. All right. So you're changing your angle now and it's going to be harder for you to stop a shot or stop that guy coming in, especially again, if you're not setting it up with the left hand, you're just like wild, right? Like, like a sucker, like most people do a sucker punch right hand. Um, 
I just don't believe in that. I believe in, in, in learning how to fight properly, learn the science, spend the time. It's not going to add 10 years to your training, but learning a good jab might add 10 years to your life. Okay. So that's just my take on it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in the philosophies that, you know, you, you can't make me a world champ, but you can make me better than I was yesterday. So if that means spending some time on a jab, by the way, you have a very nice, a very old at this point video on, on jab on your website that I've, uh, you know, uh, bought a long time ago. And it had very fundamental tweaks that everybody should know just to make sure that the punch is, uh, thrown in a way that not going to hurt you and is going to be effective. Like that is such a simple little investment in being able to like basically know how to do things better than you did yesterday. Well, thanks. Yeah. The foundations of the jab and the foundations of the footwork video, but you know, again, if somebody doesn't understand the importance of a jab, that's telling me they don't understand the whole system of how, of how to strike. Uh, I mean, we're just using the jab as the example here. But as a, again, it sets up everything, okay? Um, and and when you start doing the kind of fighting like like I like to do when like I was training a lot of you guys for the you know the ultimate like you know real no holds barred for real, having that jab can set up or or keep you out of trouble. All right, I can keep you away from me. All right, I can't keep you away if I'm just launching power bombs. You're going to get in on me, but I can keep you at bay. If I don't want to engage you, all right? So I don't know, let's say I don't want to grapple you because I don't know if you have a knife. I don't know what you have on you, okay? But I can keep you at bay with my jab, move around. If there's multiple assailants, I can keep my keep keep them away with my jab until something opens up, you know, then I could either uppercut or, you know, do a right cross or, you know, jab hook, like I mentioned, or kicks or whatever. Um, when you're talking about life, saving your life, don't make shortcuts. I mean, spend as much time as you possibly can on all your punches. It's not like we have a thousand variations, okay? It's not like, what is it, 60 official judo throws and in all the different variations. That's a lot. And wrestling has a bunch of throws and takedowns. There's, this is simple stuff. You, you, you don't have a lot of different um, variants on the punches in, in effective straight punching. So take the time to learn to do it. Yeah, and even in like, uh, you know, sports boxing, if you watch enough of it, you can really tell that uh, jab is super critical in being able to control the distance. I mean, all boxers would know, but otherwise you wouldn't be in that sport. But the, the better guys really make use of it to uh, control the distance and dictate the, where the fight happens. And this is from a fan's perspective, you know, I can I can see when when they use the jab to to help to dictate the the fight. There's also a concept, something else that I've mentioned to you before, Tony. Something that they've called I heard the announcers called that the step back, where they kind of um, some fighters tend to pounce on a guy that would leave his leading right hand out by stepping back, causing them to overcommit, and then try to hit them with like a, what they call their I guess a right hook or like you said. kind of an overhand right um, yeah have you is this like an effective technique is it something that takes years to master it the, have the you tech, seen this before well the guy that doesn't want to work on the jab will never pull this punch off because it's 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 an overhand right i'm not going to get into semantics because there's schools of thought that you can't technically throw if, if you're a orthodox fighter you th theoretically can't throw a right hook it's overhands or it's you know crosses um whatever but let's, for the sake, just call it an overhand right. But yeah, the guy commits, and then you 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 come over to top and clobber him. It's a timing thing, okay? So that's where the problem is. Uh, throwing the punch itself is, you know, you can master that punch in a month. But the footwork, the timing, that's where it, it's going to take a long time to learn. Those are the intangibles, okay? Uh, it's how can I word it? Um, it? It's like it's like having the perfect joke, okay? But you can only tell it in certain scenarios, and you got to wait. You might wait three months 
for the perfect scenario for someone to bring up a subject where you could tell this joke, okay? And you got to be ready to tell that joke when that when the opening is there, okay? So that's how it is with this punch and a lot of punches. But in your instance, inst uh, what you're talking about, yeah, you step back or you move, the, the, the punch passes you by, or you can either, you can actually kind of parry it or whatever, and then boom, and then you launch that right hand. Uh, it's all about timing. And now I want to discuss this because I've said this so many times about <clears throat> people think I'm fast and all this. And I keep saying I'm always in the right spot. It's not that I'm fast is necessarily. It's just that I'm always in the right spot to make my move. This is the thing. You've got to be in the right position to make these counter punches. Okay. It's a counter punch basically. And you, you just have to be there. You can't always be like retreating, like, like running backwards or moving backwards because then you really can't counter punch because if you take three steps back, now you got to take those three steps forward again, just to get neutral. Uh, so it's all about knowing how to be in the right spot at the right time. Okay. That's why circular motion. Now there was, a, there was quite a bit of circular motion. I think if I remember in this fight um, and I did notice the Dubois especially was doing like his foot were like, work like I do, like when I was showing the Krav Maga guys about you, you step a little bit when you're just like wasting time, but when you're actually moving, you're bouncing, you're placing yourself in the position. Okay. This is on my foundations of footwork video. Um, so instead of shuffling along, you're, you're placing yourself. So your feet are always in a perfect position. You're hopping, but not like up in the air, just like fraction of the inch, fra fractions of an inch. And this is especially good when you're on the street because you don't know what the surface is going to be. Now, if it's ice, that's a whole different story. Not a lot's going to help you on ice, no matter what. But you got to watch it. You don't trip on a crack that, that your foot doesn't get stuck on, you know, the sidewalk or something. So this this moving in place. I'll be listen. If people are curious, just go to my website. I know you guys aren't going to buy my stuff, but I have clips. Um, go to the foundations of footwork. I, I'm pretty sure I show that on there. I don't remember now on my website, but um, you'll get a kind of an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, it's that's why, you know, there's levels upon levels upon levels. And I, and I just see people looking not, I'm, I'm going to paint with a broad brush now. I'm not saying everybody, but I see people looking for shortcuts and, you know, a shortcut might help you against, in one circumstance, but eventually you you can't you you can't real rely on these shortcuts. Um, I don't want a doctor that I would go to that would tell me I know all the shortcuts, kid. Okay, you know, forget all the fancy stuff. I don't need any of that. I I, I got this thing streamlined. No, goodbye. Okay, right, I'm gonna find somebody else. All right, I want somebody that knows what the hell they're doing. And when you're when you're in a fight, you better know what the hell you're doing. Otherwise, you're gonna end up in a lot of trouble. Speech right. I, I think to your point, like uh, w when I watched some of these fights where the announcers would talk about step back, the footwork was such that the guy was able to be in a good position with his feet firmly planted to throw a, a strong counter. Like, you know, he wasn't mid shuffle, right, which would make it a suboptimal punch. Well, this is why science, the boxing is more complex in that regard than, let's say, grappling on the ground or any any style. I'm not particular because you don't need your feet to to launch you and th this and that. You're maybe you're fighting off your chest, you're on top or you're on your back, on the bottom, whatever. Even though you still need angles, which that that's a topic for another day. Uh, but yeah, your feet, your 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 footwork, all your punches come from your feet. Okay, these hand, these arm punches, again, against a chump, you'll get lucky. You'll get a knockdown or a flash knockdown or something. But you, you got to drive off your feet, okay? And it's all about learning to get those angles. And those angles can be very subtle. They don't have to be 10 feet. They could be a matter of moving your feet one inch, and the angle gets magnified, okay? I can't demonstrate this. And for those who are listening, they it wouldn't you know they wouldn't be able to see it, but I can literally let's say kick behind you, kick your leg from the back if I'm facing you, by not moving all the way behind you, 
but just by moving over like an inch or so gives me the angle that I need to clip you. Same with a shot, with a takedown, or same with a punch. You know, it, 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 the angle it gets amplified. It's 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 mathematics, really, is what it is. And in essence, it's science. Um, and that's why they used to call boxing the sweet. Well, they probably still call boxing the sweet science. Oh, there's absolutely. a lot. There's a lot to it. And and people just look at boxing. Oh, punch, punch, punch. Man, punching is just like the dessert over a full course meal. That's just, man, that's just, man, boom. There's so much to, oh, it's, it's, it, it, and it even bothers me today because I see so many boxers that just aren't utilizing all the concepts that exist in boxing. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, bo boxing's changed. I don't know why. I got my opinions, my theories, but who knows what the truth is? I don't know. Uh, let's just say that, you know, they're, they're, they're going in other sports or they're not even going, or, or they're not even going into sports and, um, you know, which, which isn't a bad thing, which is probably a good thing, but yeah, boxing isn't what it used to be. And you know that. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've talked about how prolific it used to be and it isn't anymore. And therefore the, the population that you can pick from for your top athletes is just not what it used to be. Um, what, one more thing that I wanted to cover, um, you know, maybe our final uh, piece of information on boxing. I also heard somebody make a statement that really the hardest thing about boxing is defense. And the hardest thing about defense is learning how to stop pawing and trying to fight the hands or defending is the hands and instead glue your hands to your face and defend with your body. Absolutely. How would you comment on that? Whoever said that, I cannot agree more. That's perfect. That's that's the thing. The thing. Like the you talk about pawing. So for those who are watching, so like let's say okay, you were facing and you're doing this with your lead hand. No, you've got to learn how to defend with your back hand. Again, your body, keeping your hands close. So this way, if I can defend here, I can counter now with my lead hand. All right. If I'm over here with this, I'm wide open for a counter. So this is I talk about this on one of my videos about it's called catching punches. And you're not literally catching it like you're catching a ball, but you're just blocking it, you know. Um, you kind of do like a windshield wiper thing, or you know, you can parry and defend, you know, in different ways. Whoever said that to you is com completely correct. Uh you you you've got to start learning to move your head, you know, angles with the slipping, um, you know, weaving under, bobbing a little bit. Uh not ducking is all right, but not in a street fight because then you're you're you can get choked out. But if the guy's committing to a punch, he's already committed. Yeah, but watch out for knees. And you know, there, there's it, it, again, it's more complex than that. But you still have to learn how to do all of these things. Um, and then you can you can pick and choose when to do it. But yeah, that is exactly right. So my opinion is this, or the way I, I like to train people is that first use your feet. Okay. Learn to you, put the transport system, learn your feet, the footwork to get you out of harm's way. This has got to be trained slowly. And then you can start adding in, you know, uh, upper body movement, you know, slips and so on again, slowly, safely. And then you can start putting your hands up, learning how to block and all of that. Cause everybody's instincts instinct right away is to just block with their hands. You know, many times, I'll have them either put their hands behind their back, put their hands in their pocket. And then, you know, that's scary for a lot of folks. Okay. It's nerve wracking because this guy's throwing punches at you. Your, your instinct is to flinch and to cover up. No, you got to break all that shit. Okay. So learn how to move with your feet first, then plant yourself, learn how to slip and, you know, roll around, you know, do all the shoulder rolls and all that stuff that like Roy, uh, Mayweather and other fighters do really learn to do that and then put your hands up. Then that's the last thing um, to, to learn, the, you know, the way I teach it, at least other coaches may teach it in a different way, but as long as they cover all those elements, um, you're going to be fine. And then once you have all of that, then you got to learn how to counter off of all the punches, uh, you know, that the opponent's throwing. So remember this, Every time I throw a punch at you, unless you're wide open, see, I'm, I'm wide open. I'm leaving myself wide open. Once I'm out of this turtle shell, I'm extending myself and a, and a crafty fighter 
can capitalize on that. So it may behoove you to be a counterpuncher at times. You know, so when the opponent is not even landing the first punch, but when he's setting up and maybe trying to throw, like like we were talking about that step back punch, that punch don't even land and you're able to counter him. So that's something that you probably should start learning to, to do as well um, is to work on your counter punching too before you even start learning uh, to be offensive. Because you'll just end up like if it, it, let's say I go up against a guy you, or you go up against a guy who's never boxed before and you're just teeing off on it, okay, to the point where he quits. Well, you're not going to get anywhere with that, okay? What if what? Okay, you, you clobbered this guy, but what about the next guy that you can't tee off on? And now you think you're so good, all these punches you're leaving yourself wide open because now you're throwing sloppy punches wide and stupid loops and shit. Uh, now he's clobbering you, so you got to cover all those bases. All it takes is one good punch, man, from somebody, and your your life could be over. And I mean that for real. I mean, you could fall in the street. Hit your head. That's it. That happens more often than people think. Oh yeah, there's a famous case like that when one of the cousins of uh, the mayor, Daly, ex mayor yeah. Daly, did that. And yeah, his nephew, yeah, <laughs> with somebody dead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but my point is, there's, you know, there. I, I I'm just not a shortcut kind of guy. Okay. Um, We've talked about this today, even in the military, where you get these crash courses or whatever. It doesn't even have to be the military. Any like six, 12 week course, you're, how good are you going to get? You're not. Okay. You're going to get exposed to things. Okay. And it may pique your interest, but you're opening yourself up now to a lifetime of, of alternate training. It takes years to get mastery of something. Okay. Uh, or close to mastery. Let's just use the term mastery. You may never master it. And we're really, what is a master? And if you do master something, it's only momentary because age will catch up with you. And then all of a sudden, boom, you lost your mastery, right? So any get rich quick scheme or learn how to fight in six easy lessons, it's a, it's a come on, it's a scam. So avoid that. Learn learn a few moves at a time, a couple, two or three, just something so you don't get maybe bored and drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it under the guidance of a good coach. So you're not in, you know, ingraining poor muscle memory uh, and, and bad body mechanics. Uh, it's imperative. You know, if you want to have a good career, you know, as a pro fighter, you, you can't start off by losing a bunch of fights. <clears throat> or you can't get, hope that you're, you got the looks and the, you know, the physique or whatever it is. And, and the promoter is going to set you up with tomato cans. Okay. And if you're in a street fight, you got to hope that you don't run into something that's going to end your life or seriously uh, incapacitate you or alter you for the rest of your life. Uh, that's why you got to master this stuff. It just takes time and you know, it just can't be learned quickly. You just, you, I'm sorry. It just can't like, you know, falling in love with somebody. I mean, you get these knuckleheads that love at first sight and shit, but for real, love or friendship or trust takes a while to to, to develop those feelings of uh, whatever. You know, it just doesn't happen in, you know, a weekend crash course, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tony, we covered a lot. I, I think that we should um, mention a few of your upcoming seminars before before we go. And well, you're going to we'll, be at the one this coming weekend. Yeah, we I got coming up the 17th and 18th of December. You'll be at the 17th. You'll be my guy that I'm working with at Bender's Martial Arts and Fitness in Andersonville. The links are on my website. Um, I think Joe probably gave you the info to put on the YouTube channel. And then the very right. next, the next from, yeah, 1.30 to 3.30, I think. And then the next day, I'm going to be in DuPage at DuPage Krav Maga with Chuck May, a retired police officer, and there'll be a bunch of you know nice people there. That's from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, so two hour th hours there, which is just enough because we, we're, we're working heavy-duty techniques here. So if you if you can make it, people, I, I really would appreciate it. Um, and, yeah, you'll get to meet Joe if you come Saturday to 
to Bender's Martial Arts and Fitness. Um, and you'll get to meet, of course, Jason, who's been on the show. Chuck May has been on the show. We got to get him back on as well. Um, and Chuck's an interesting fellow. And those are all Krav guys. They're all his students, uh, Krav Maga, which is very interesting. And I believe, if not, I mean, you never know who's going to show up. <clears throat> but like the last seminar, everyone was a black belt instructor. Okay. So if, if you're new or you, you, whatever your level, skill level is, they're there to learn the ground fighting. But last week or, or last month, I was teaching strikes and footwork. But you're going to be around all black belts or pretty much. Uh, and yet they're all humble and great people. So, uh, and the same at, at Bender's Martial Art and Fitness. Let's just see. We don't. I don't know who's going to turn up because it's a seminar. So, uh, but yeah, if you guys can make it, that'd be great. Yeah, you'll walk out with something. I guarantee it. Like like I said, you you know you you can't get made world champion in a, in a day, but you can always be better than you were the day before. Yeah, no one will hit you with an equilibrium shot either. So don't worry about it. All right. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. yeah so I guess everybody. That. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But buddy. I want to wait before we sign off. I just want to thank Joe or, or uh, Martin for subbing for Joe. And I, I'm sure Joe is going to watch this and, and, and his wife, Sasha. So I hope you have a good time in Paris, find a jazz accordionist. There's tons of them over there. Get a good cafe. And Joe, I know you do not start an international incident. And because it's the world cup, you know, France is playing. So don't, start any hooligan stuff over there please joe so anyway everybody i'll see you thanks for watching we'll see you guys next week and hopefully some of you will show up at the seminars that's right okay